Hello and welcome to Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am absolutely delighted to introduce to you for the first time on the show, Zita McMillan from Predictive Black. Zita, how are you? I am very well, thank you, Toby. And I'm sorry if you hear any weird noises in my background. There are pheasants just landed in my garden. Do you know which, what? Um, over the last over the last year, <laughs> last year we've had all sorts of things pop up, from ice cream vans to, to kids to dogs. It's the first time we've been interrupted by pheasants. So I'm, no, invite, I'm really invite them in. Invite, invite them in. I've actually, no, they're enormous. I'm, I know the distinctive tone of a pheasant as well from spending a bit of time down in Devon over there. But that's well, they're right. They're literally right outside my window right now. There's two, <laughs> there's two quite significant ones just landed to scoff food off the floor from the bird feeders. So I do apologise if there's so that. Off, this, this, is, this is an extraordinary start to an interview. And, and I know you uh, I'm gonna make it, it you. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make it even more so by talking about our off-camera chat about you talking shooting guns in Miami. So, oh, so no! <laughs> I imagine those pheasants I imagine those pheasants are, are quaking if they only knew half the things that we've just been talking about so um, anyway as, <laughs> i'm gonna bring it back in into into the room and because uh, we could be going off on that that tangent for a long long time so we, we've had a fascinating conversation already now about the business and, and predictive black um for those people who haven't heard too much about it you started it in february 20, 2019 and we'll talk about that in a minute because i think it's a really interesting time to start a business and what a runway over the first two years of incubation of, of, of the company we'll come on to all that in a second Beforehand, please give us a little bit of background about you and uh, that sort of fantastic and, and varied career so far, and then the sort of origins of Predictive Black and what, and what you guys are doing at the moment, if you would. I will. So I like to think that my career has had an evolution of stages. That's uh, that's probably the kindest way to describe it. So I started out very long time ago now in advertising. So I did lots of exciting things, went on lots of TV shoots, met lots of crazy, interesting people. You know, did guns all- in Miami. <laughs> A few guns in Miami. Yeah, exactly. That's some brilliant, you know, just like fabulous, fabulous experiences. And then and then I'm sure lots of people who you've met and spoken to, lots of people watching will will recognize this pathway that the more senior you get, the less fun any particular industry is. And you, you know, all the good stuff you used to love about what you did somebody else gets to do and you get to do the difficult stuff the sort of gritty financial side of it and kind of negotiations and all that kind of stuff. So I was in advertising for a long time. Then I moved into government communications. And I went to work for the least popular government department. And that is a high bar in terms of government popularity. <laughs> um, so I went to work for the Department for Work and Pensions, which I absolutely loved, by the way. I was looking after job seekers and it was such an amazing privilege, actually. And I'm sad that civil servants get such a bad reputation because having moved into it from the outside, it was an awesome experience. We were, um, you went up there in Fleetwood, were you? No, well, I moved around actually. So I was based in Westminster, and then we had uh, offices all over the the country, and so I did get to move around quite a lot up and down the land at the various yeah, yeah. Different locations. So yeah, so then I went on. So I went from the least popular government department. Now, then I went to being a financial <laughs> regulator. So if you're looking at a sort of popularity at dinner. <laughs> I was moving down the curve pretty quickly at this point. The reverse I, rock and roll. But yeah, now, though. Yeah, I was definitely... I love that too, actually. So I think if you move, if you move into those sorts of businesses and those sorts of areas, you you discover things about yourself. And I discovered that I was really nerdy about weird things that I didn't necessarily know about myself. And I think that's then led me into this crazy world that we're in now. So I moved from, from regulation, went off to work in consumer lending, which was... Fab all, you know, all over Europe, very interesting, and then started Predictive Black. And it's um, it's one of those things that people actually say to you, you've got to be crazy to start your own business. Like, you really must be slightly mad. And I thought, well, okay, fine, that fits. And you need to work Positive. with slightly mad people. Yeah, exactly. I was like, yeah, okay, I've, I've got crazy people I want to work with. That's all good. Um, and you've got to have a great business idea and stuff. And I was like, okay, I think we've got a good idea. Let's see if we can make this work. So, yeah, so went from the security of, you know, fully paid employment, which is a great place to be, to starting your own business and funding it yourself. And, you know, you see your savings kind of go down (laughs) as you start funding it. And then, you know, and here we are with Predictive Black. And we set out on this crazy journey to really do something different. We looked at the SME marketplace and we looked at larger SMEs and we thought there's a lot of data out there that these guys don't touch they don't access 
we talked to lots of them and they weren't really forecasting properly. They weren't looking at their cash management. We're like, okay, so how could we bring together some software that could help them manage their business better, but combine that with data that, that would benefit them from a decision-making perspective. So then you get into the kind of like moment of, you know, what are we going to do? So we created Predictive Black and we spent a long time not quite as long as it took us to get FCA authorized, but a long time <laughs> to then uh, build out the software. And we started with what we call our industry analysis, which is about three and a half billion data points now. So we look at every sector of the UK and we look at their revenue, their costs and their cash and we give an outlook. And so it's a really interesting way of benchmarking a sector and how you fit in a sector. And then together with that, we're in the Microsoft for Startups program. Love them. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're in that. So we do everything. We've got lots of machine learning. You know, we've got predictive forecasts for cash flow. We're registered. We bring in open banking, open accounting data to create forecasts and, and spreadsheet, a different way of looking at a spreadsheet for our clients. So we don't use spreadsheets, sadly. So, yeah, so that's and where that's where we are now. I love that. It's, uh, I was saying to you uh, off camera beforehand that, that uh, reading the bio of the business and, and sort of doing a bit of research, that there is probably every cool bit of technology that's going that's yeah. been involved in, in, in the business at the moment yeah. and every cool area of finance that, that you're you're in. So if I if I have my bingo sheet in there, I think I'll be winning pretty, pretty quickly. That's, uh, and that's that, our yeah, Friday but, afternoon game, by the way. You just nailed yeah. Friday afternoon. <laughs> But this is, uh, yeah, this, 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 this to me is really interesting because, you know, we do a lot of work, as you know, looking at you know, some of the fastest growing and, and, and most successful businesses in the space at the moment. And, uh, you know, when, when you look at it, a lot of it is around working in the right areas and working with the right technology and, and, and keeping things as simple as possible. And I know that's a big area of, of what you guys look at and do. And we'll come on to that again in a minute. I just want to go through that, you know, that, that journey and that startup point, as you say, look, launching a business in 2019 as you, as you rightly say starting a business is you've got, you've got to be mad i'm well, well aware well aware of that and have the scars to prove it uh, and and 2019 was an interesting year because it was you know still relatively robust and, and you probably had you know if, if any economic tailwind was there there it was the the sort of specter of um of brexit so a business comes into it as you say you're setting up you're getting fca or uh, authorized you know really starting to to, to know yourself and as, as a business and then this comes up, uh, the pandemic, argue, you know, argue when it starts, but March is where it really blew up in, in the UK last year. Tell us about the last year and how that's been as a, as a startup business dealing with, uh, de de dealing with the pandemic right at the very start, the infancy of the business. Yeah, well, I think, first off, if you're doing something predicated on prediction, when yeah. you are dealing with a once in a generation, once in a lifetime event, then prediction is tricky. So everything you thought you knew and all the, you know, the great work we've done on our machine learning algorithms and everything we'd kind of worked out about the sectors and all the kind of intense work that had gone into it in 2019 to really kind of dissect and think about sectoral influences, which variables from data perspective actually drive certain outcomes in a sector. You have to kind of take a step back and go, ah, is that still true? Mm. Is it still the case? That this happens or is that still the case and then we what we were watching as obviously the government intervened was where we would be looking at the health of a sector and we'd look at cash on deposit and we'd look at sme lending we would look at overdraft lending suddenly what had been happening changed completely so you look at the historic trend and a sector will be bubbling along you know maybe the lending would be at a certain level and then you know they'd spike and you'd see all this free money come into the system you're like okay so then what? What's going to happen now? Well, overdraft lending, we know, is going to drop off the cliff. So that's fine. We can work through that. But the entire year, things changed all the time. So from our perspective, we sort of pulled ourselves back a little bit. We were planning on going for a full launch kind of early last year. That had to go by the wayside, to be honest, because there was no way we could do what we felt made us different, which was the predictive analytics in a global pandemic where nobody had a clue what was going to come next yeah. so we really we really kind of sucked our teeth a little bit in uh, in the old-fashioned way of thinking about it and so well, well what do we do so okay so we'll spend time really refining and honing the service and the software we'll spend time with our beta clients and kind of really work out where would we be trying to you know change the algorithm and we'll just keep keep going and keep looking and keep refining so we learned a huge amount we learned 
about personal resilience in ourselves because this was not the year we thought we were going to have you know I guess practically speaking we're at least a year behind where we wanted to be we learned a lot about the target clients we were going for because most of them didn't even know if they'd be in business so there was a real pulling back from any form of adoption of new technology so you could carry on having conversations but no one's going to sign off on a new deal right there's there's that kind of uh, reluctance and, and we learned a lot about how the economy is going to perform in certain ways. And then what we're trying to do is then think, OK, so what does that mean for 2021? You know, because the data is going to tell the machine one thing, but that's not going to happen, fingers crossed, again, the following mm. year. So then you've got to read through all again. So not only are you kind of in real time trying to to re- react to your algorithms and go, oh, OK, that's not quite right. You know, let's keep on going. You've got to then remember that everything's going to be different the following year. So you have to keep correcting. So if you were in data science or if you were in any form of machine learning and data, this last 12 months, kudos to anyone who hasn't gone completely batshit mental. So <laughs> I had to cut that out. Uh, but, you know, because it's been hard. It's been really tough. It has, isn't it? And, and, and I think that's, a, that's you know, as you, you use the word there, I think is is, is really important, which is resilience. And, and I think it's sort of, uh, you know, I, I've been massively inspired you know, all year by speaking to people founders like yourselves and, and and a lot of people who've started over the last two three years who've taken a battering um <laughs> you know in, in reality around uh, around something which is completely uncontrollable and unexpected it's it's uh, it's force majeure but what i loved about what you just said there was was the ability to to reflect to hone and to improve and i think businesses there that have, have, have utilized this time to to see it as a as a real opportunity mm. um, and look you may be a year behind but what's not to say that that's actually allowed you to travel you know three years quicker over the next few years because that ability to really understand it to be ahead of it to use the use cases and, and you know the beta clients as you say at the moment to have a really stronger product to go to market because quite often people rush products don't they and, and uh, you know we'll talk a little bit later about the sort of uh, pluses and minuses of rest, restless leadership but um <laughs> There is, uh, we, we all want to do things yesterday. We all want to get you know, ahead and, and startup stories want to be, be successful in that next unicorn as quickly as possible. But actually that sort of ability to rest, pause, improve. And, and, I, and I had a great um, interview with someone a couple of weeks ago on this, where it was, where it was we really wanted to use this crisis to, to make sure we came out of it better. And it seems to me that that's something which, which you've absolutely been afforded to do because you know, t- the big theme of what we've been talking about over the last year is turning the negative into a positive. Mm-hmm. One of the negatives that we've seen in the FS markets for, for many years has been a sort of reluctance to sort of really embrace new technology, to adopt new technology into the DNA, the organization of a business. Now, joking before about the sort of buzzword bingo of, uh, of data, AI, open banking and, and machine learning and everything in between. They're, they're enormous subjects and enormously cool subjects to be dealing with and, and have and, and have enormous possibility. But all of them have been lagging, in my opinion, in the FS space for, for, for quite some time because of a conservative nature of C-suite in, uh, executives within F- FS who love the idea of it, but are also terrified of being sacked if, if something goes wrong or isn't quite. You know, that, that fear of change, I think, is, has been char- you know, a characterization of, of the FS markets for some time. Tell me a little bit about what you've seen and of the the adoption of new technology and, and how you know, how people can, can be unnerved on that and how how embracing that technology can provide uh, it was has probably been accelerated I think like no other time beforehand over the last twelve months. Yeah, I mean, I think th- there's one thing which is that everybody talks about their willingness to adopt new technology. Because to say you're unwilling is actually to mark yourself as a sort of person kind of on the on the exit runway, if you like. So first of all, nobody will tell you honestly that they're terrified of technology. They just won't because they can't. And and I totally get that. Um, and, And maybe they're not absolutely honest with themselves about how much they are afraid of it. And and everybody is human, right, to be afraid of something you don't understand. And there are very few people out there who fully understand what the technology is actually doing. So I think the challenge for people like me and for for software providers is to to not allow people to focus on the fear of what they don't understand about the actual, the mechanics of the technology. Because, you know, you don't know what's powering your laptop. You know, you don't understand what the RAM's doing inside there. 
you've no clue, but you just rely on it to do what it does. And I think technology is, is it's both its blessing and its curse is that it's interesting to people, right? Yeah. So particularly the stuff we use. So we use machine learning, you know, we've got um, elements of deep learning that happens in our, in our algorithm. So and people are interested because they're buzzy, you know, as you say. But the challenge is if you fear it because you don't understand the how it works, then actually adoption of it is slower because you can't explain it. Any CFO yeah. can explain how the formula or, well, maybe not any CFO, but because most of them won't want to look at the, the, the formula <laughs> in every single spreadsheet, right? They'll be like, oh, my God. You're yeah, certainly um, glazed by the time they get to it anyway. <laughs> yeah, right? but they know, but they know. They know how it's been put together. And if they had to, they could deconstruct it and reconstruct it. So there's a safety net there. There's the security about comprehension. And I think technology's downside is that you, you can't reach in and kind of just touch it the way you can with old fashioned stuff. So what we have to do is, is show people the benefits of it. So don't just tell me there's tech in there, you know, that kind of thing. Don't tell me you're funny. Tell me a joke. So I think with technology, we have to do the same. Don't tell me you're clever. Show me how it works and show me what the benefits to me are. And that's the transformational moment. So I've talked to a lot of people in the last 12 months and I get a lot of feedback going, oh, I don't really trust machine learning, you know, and I'm like, OK, why? You know, what, what, what is it that, that concerns yeah. you? I don't know how it's learning. And I'm like, oh, that's okay. I can, let me, let me help take you on this little journey about what's happening to the data that's gone in. And actually, and this is what the machine is now doing. And it's looking for patterns. And it's very simple. It's very simply looking for a pattern. And when it finds a pattern, it will apply that going forward to your cash flow forecast in our, in our example. And therefore, it then knows what to expect. So it then tells you what to expect. And it's kind of that simple. When you make it easier for people to understand and you, you don't oversimplify it because you're talking to really smart people, right? So you don't, yeah. you don't, it's not a patronizing thing. It's just saying, it's just a different way of looking at your data. And actually the machine is doing something else that if you had 15 people all looking at it, then you possibly would get there, but it just take you quite a long time, you know, and this is, this is cutting through all of that for you. And, you know, and it's going to be good. You know, it's okay. So you there's, have to- there's a- yeah, this, uh, sorry to, to, to cut in, but I think it's I, th- I think it's really really interesting what you're saying there because that simplification is um, uh, there's a phrase I love which is common sense and that is, is really common practice and and, uh, <laughs> and 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 in technology and particularly tech founders you quite often see some really clever ideas that people love talking about in a really clever way if that doesn't <laughs> that doesn't sound that sounds stupid, I've been but, in um, those rooms mm. <laughs> yeah and it's and it's there and it, and, and, it, and it becomes overcomplicated and I, I remember having something brought to me um, from someone who works at the brokerage uh, and it and on the surface of it it was it seemed you know in his, in his mind he was absolutely adamant it was a no-brainer now it was way over my head I'm very pleased to say, to, to, to say that very happy to say that not pleased but it was, it was way, way over my, my head. And, and when he was talking about it, it was talking about it with passion. It was the passion of the individual, which really excited me about the project. And he wanted yeah. some uh, um, some involvement for me. Now, I would have been involved in the person, but I didn't know enough about the actual concept to be able to to, you know, to invest at that sort of stage. So I took it to a few of my friends who are way more intelligent than, than I am and, and easy to, and, and, and uh, far more qualified to be able to, to put their tuppence worth into it. And actually, when they looked at it and, and were trying to read the pitch deck, it was too complicated for anyone I could find who could put it in front of it. Now, this person would, would be very frustrated about trying to then deliver exactly what they were trying to say. But if you can't articulate what you're going to say in a very simple term, your project cannot get that traction. And I think one of the great common golden threads of founders and, and, and salespeople and CROs in, in startup businesses who are looking at complex technology is the art of making that story and those use cases, as you, you know, effectively, as you say, mm-hmm. very, very clear as to saying, look, here's your problem and how we can solve it. Yeah. And that's exactly what I think you're talking about right now, right? And, and actually, that is really fascinating because I think, and I've met a lot of fellow founders who would fall into the camp you've described, who are so not necessarily um, enamoured with what they've created in, in that sense, but they're so deeply enmeshed in it that it's quite hard to pull back and say so how do I explain this to a lay person yeah. or someone frankly who is very very clever in their own field but isn't in this specific space and I think 
you know, my my good fortune in having such a varied career is that I have been able to use communications and, you know, been in advertising and looked after marketing and written speeches and stuff. And so I've I've over the years had to be able to get to grips with complex subject areas and translate it into something that most people would find understandable at least so you know from my perspective it's great if you're able to do that and then bring that skills to bear and I feel for people who haven't maybe had some of that same training because it's really hard it's not it sounds easy to be able to make something complex sound easy but it's actually it's not actually it takes a bit of effort yeah it's it's incredibly difficult and it's an incredibly under undervalued skiller i i think i'm going to write that down for my personal appraisal toby just so you know (laughs) (laughs) don't praise it myself (laughs) said you did all right there (laughs) i'll write the recommendation on linkedin i'll write the recommendation on linkedin let me let me um let me talk to you about another area that you've um you've touched on which is data itself and and look if we're looking there about um the adoption of technology being a challenge and, and sort of helping people go on that journey to you know to adopt it and to sort of explain it to the you know to the, to the lay person for want of a better expression there's also been this this sort of uh, mystique around data for, mm-hmm. for for many years it's been the exciting and cool thing to talk about we've seen it exploding if i'm going to look at where you know probably one of the highest job peaks in in global recruitment is at the moment it'll be around data and, and uh, data science etc cetera, etc cetera. if you were to talk to your children about where they should be pointing their careers at the moment you'd probably be saying data science and and something to do with data Yet still, I think the number of people who are utilizing it and utilizing it, you know, genuinely authentically to to create genuine value to their business in the financial markets is minimal. I mean, you, you only have to look at somewhere like Amazon, as a, for example, just to see how genuinely revolutionary it, it can be when used properly. And I would say that's probably for me the best use case. And you're, you're far better position the me to, to say it but to me that's one of the great use cases of, of data tesco even with club card um would be yeah. another area and what dunhumby did there is something which i find utterly inspirational and it's and it's been something which i've been genuinely fascinated with for 10 years about how you can utilize data to make true advantage into it yet i look around and i see loads of hiring in data and i see loads of businesses doing um you know more and more with data but i don't see necessarily people who are utilizing it to the utmost of their ability. That's something you guys are looking to change, right? It is. And I think what's fascinating, I mean, you go back 10 years and everybody was talking about, well, do you have a data warehouse? You know, what would that be? And then, Mm -hmm. and then the warehouse became old school and everyone had a data lake, you know, geez, what was going on in the data lake, you know, and then, you know, and then data, just this thing, it just became this amorphous, crazy place that, you know, actually when you talk to, to businesses, the first thing you ask is, you know, do you know how clean your data is? So if you were, if you were uh, an auditor or an accountant, you, all you're really after is that the, the company's own data is clean. And so that's where open banking mm. has been revolutionary, right? Because it's all untouched by human hands. So for a software like mine, open banking data is like, thank you, you know, amazing. You know, we get the open banking data. Nobody's interfered with it. It is just raw data. Beautiful, beautiful things. And it's super clean, right? So we bring all that in. And then it's kind of what do you do when you've got it? And I think that I, I think the sadness slightly with the last 10 years, with the excitement and everybody talking about big data and, you know, were you into big data? Don't even know what it is, you know. And so that a lot of people actually moved backwards and went, I don't know. Am I? I don't know. I don't know what to do when I know it. And so there was this popular refrain a few years ago, which I'm sure you heard, which is if only I knew what I knew when it came to data. So all companies have this massive repository of data, but it couldn't answer a simple question. Like, can you tell me why X in my supply chain is costing more than it did last year versus Y in my supply chain? Nope. Pretty much nobody would be able to answer a really simple question. So I think data has got a bit of a bad rep now, actually. If you're you're a business owner, if you're a leader in a big business, you're probably kind of going, Oof, it, you know, these lakes and warehouses are costing me millions and I'm not really sure what I'm getting for it, actually. Or yeah. data goes yeah. in and I can't get it out. And so I think from our perspective, we were looking to, this is a very 2019 word now I'm going to throw at you. We were going to democratise it. <laughs> right? You're only oh, it's got me nostalgic that. now. Yeah, I know. So right? pre-COVID, 
you're so yeah. you're so pre-covid <laughs> i know i know i looked at my old business plan i was like oh you guys you know democratizing <laughs> i was quite i was quite sad for our old selves actually i was like oh <laughs> but in a sense that remains the case right so so we look at data and we look at what is the relevance what are we trying to say so any form of data that you bring in there has to be a purpose to it so if you're in the business you're looking at your cost base and you're analyzing it for a specific reason can you reduce it can you remove inefficiencies you know you're not looking at it just just for pleasure maybe you are i don't know but so the data has to have a purpose so we look at data so we can corral it into an outlook for a sector and we look at the revenue and we look at costs and we look at cash So pretty much every business, no matter how big they are, would look at revenue and then they might call it assets and liabilities. You know, they've moved on from costs and cash and they have assets and liabilities. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's the same thing. So we look at all this variability of data. We bring in, you know, exogenous data and we crunch it all together and we say, so what? What does this mean? And then for our clients, we then benchmark them to their sector. So when we connect a client, when we onboard a client, we connect through their banking data. We look at their accounting software. We therefore can analyze their ledger and look at their suppliers and their clients and their performance. So we know how their their base is performing. But crucially, then we connect it to their sector. Right. So if I've got a manufacturer of dairy products and yes, you can get deeper and deeper into the data, I can say, well, okay, Mr. Whippy, I don't know, other ice creams are available. Um, (laughs) You you are manufacturing ice cream and yet your performance relative to your sector is not as good. You know, the revenue is increasing, but yours isn't or it's growing and yours isn't. You know, so what are you going to do? So it's about presenting data in a way that people can instantly understand. Ah, it's telling me this. And then so what? So now I know my revenue isn't isn't performing as well. What the hell are we going to do about that as a business? You know, and if I have to go and draw down on my loan facility and I know my performance is not as good, ugh, that's tricky. So so for me, data is still super exciting, mm. but it has to be relevant. And you as a as a provider of data, or you know, when we provide dashboards and you know different ways of looking at data, you've got to work really hard to make it usable, useful, and relevant. That's like, and yeah. if you're not doing that, then then don't do it, actually. Go do something else. Yeah, that usable, useful, and relevant, I think is is absolutely hitting the nail on the head, isn't it? It's, uh, it, there's, there's an awful lot of numbers and figures and statistics that, that people you know, splurge out, but it's where, yeah. where is it actually gonna add that value? And when you talk there, um, again, in the, in the very simple way of, of of delivering it when you're talking there about data which you can benchmark in in your industry which you can show to as you were talking about sort of uh you know look for in in fundraising or whatever it may it may be you know that becomes stuff there which really moves the needle yeah and when or you if were you're talking, a lender you know so we were talking we've been talking to lenders and actually lenders have had a torrid time because if you've not been giving out free money from the government then your loan book is looking pretty um tricky right now so they are also working through a process of recalibrating their risk profile and their underwriting so when we're talking to lenders we're like okay but which sectors are good for you and intuitively an underwriter will say oh well I don't like this sector I think they're a bad risk why uh, well you know I just don't think the, the book has performed terribly well okay but why why you know and I'm I'm, I'm like a three-year-old why 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 yeah. horrific annoying um I try and ask different questions as well but so what we're trying to say is okay so here is some data that validates or challenges your assumptions about a sector and if it validates your assumptions tick brilliant if it challenges your assumptions that's even better because actually what you can then do is go okay so what else is happening in the business that is making me think that's a bad bet versus this data would say it's actually quite a good bet I wonder where that kind of you know misalignments happened and and do I want to change and maybe I don't you know maybe I don't want to change but I now know with certainty that certain things are happening in the sector that I can then use to support my lending criteria or the business case or whatever it may be so I think there are you know from a use case perspective data must be there and present to help people make those decisions and that's and that's why i care about it so much because i'm like it's all there look we can show you it's all fine <laughs> I, I, yeah I, I love hearing you talk about this because it's uh yeah that that sort of demystification i think is a, is a really important part of, of that maybe that that's the 2021 word 
I've gone back. I've gone back to probably. So there was a a course I went on in two thousand and three, which is oh. called about the demystification of IT. But maybe I've just bought it back. You never know. Bring it back. <laughs> bring it back. You know, if 20, I can't 20, democratize, maybe nearly, I can demystify. Nearly, nearly twenty years is time enough, I think, to resurrect. It's now almost thing. vintage. It's back on trend again. <laughs> so, so um, no, I want to I want I want to wrap this up by talking a little bit about um about you and and the future of the business and, and everything in between so you have described yourself and your style as restless and impatient which i think is uh, things there where you might do that face but you might also see it as to me uh, something which i think is as, as, as a leadership trait is a badge of honor um because it means that sort of curiosity and you use that word mm. word, word beforehand again that sort of classic uh, why 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 i think is a, is a great trait to have to have because restless means that there's there's future. You talk there about being a, you know, potentially a year behind because of everything that we've had had beforehand in, in your watch, which I imagine in everyone else's will probably be about uh, a year ahead of everything which which you're looking at. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about what what uh, 2021 looks like for Predictive Black and what the future holds and why you're so excited about your business at the moment. So I think there's a well, we've got lots of really exciting conversations happening with clients that had gone on hold last year, you know, and in fairness, you know, everybody was a bit sort of head down. Will we make it or will we not? So they're, they're really exciting. I'm looking forward to some of those things uh, landing. And we'd, we've got a lot of partnerships, actually, that we're looking to explore as well. So I think what we've created slots neatly into other people's services. And I think one of the best ways you can demystify software and technology is by working with other people to kind of go and look, it's all fine. You know, you can kind of hold hands with each other and go, it's good. We'll take you on this little journey with us. So there's a lot of that. I did describe it though to a friend who said, so you've got all of these plates spinning. I was like, yes, it's like a Greek wedding. And one of my co-founders is a Greek heritage, so I, we were allowed to say this. I said, and my <laughs> fear is that if all these plates, which we brilliantly got kind of going at the moment, if they suddenly turn into a Greek wedding and start crashing around us and they all were trying to catch them all, then that's going to be the best, most stressful time ever. Because <laughs> then yeah. I'm suddenly going to have to go, wait, I need to get this, that, that, you know. So, yeah, so I'm looking forward to being stressed to my eyeballs. That's what I'm That's what I'm <laughs> So that sounds like uh, that, that there was a there was a, a, a friend of mine who was talking about having uh, playing golf with uh, the the owner of a large chain of supermarkets. Okay. Um, this is this again goes back a long time, and uh, he was probably in his seventies. The owner of this, and he was still very much involved in in the uh, in the business. And uh, they said, "Why do you?" you know, they said to him, "Can why 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 do you still do it?" And he turned around and he goes, "Daily." I love the aggro was the, was the words. And that's always put, like, <laughs> stuck stuck in my head for 15 odd years now. That conversation of, of, uh, of being someone who, who isn't put off by that, but is actively seeking the, the, uh, the smashing plates and the, yeah, the spinning of plates exciting. and keeping and those things going. It's why you go into business. It's why you set up your own business, right? And even though it's it's you know a bit behind where we'd like it to be, and I look at my own, I use my own software to do my own cash flow forecast and go, cool, jeepers. Um, <laughs> You know, so I think there's there's always going to be that level of kind of, you know, just stress, like, you know, business ownership stress. But the the idea that there'll be so many things that we're doing all at the same time is just super exciting. Very, very exciting indeed. Zita, I know there's going to be people here. I could, I could be speaking about this for ages and, I, and I've, I've just seen the time and realised we're over, overshooting, which is which is on me. But. <laughs> Uh, which is what I love because it means that we're having a good conversation and and, uh, and and as I say, I could be on it for another hour and a half and I've only thought it was half an hour's running time. But there'll be people out there who want to know a lot more about what Predictive Black and you, you are doing. What's the best way of them getting in touch with you? Hit me up on LinkedIn. There we go. Simple as love that. Love a bit of LinkedIn. <laughs> well, we shall be tagging you in when we, when we put this live. It is absolutely brilliant to speak to you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And uh, we've really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ruby. And the pheasants didn't get in the way, I don't think. I, only I heard, heard one. I heard one. You heard one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I knew, and I nearly mentioned it, but you're mid-flow and I didn't want to cut it off, but I loved yeah. it. And that. actually, I could see one. And I've got a window over there. I could see it walking. I was like, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> it is my favourite. I, I would... I can honestly say now that we've had it's the first one where we've had uh, like wild livestock that have, uh, have managed to. Uh, I know, right? Uh, Living in the countryside. Crash the show. I love it. I love it. Zita, thank you so much. And Thanks, thank you everybody. all for watching. We will see you soon on another episode of FinTech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.